Hello and welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales. If you've never been here before, my name is Rory and you're on the Varietal Literature YouTube page. And what we do here is we have good fun with narrative on and writing. And on Thursdays we do sort of more fun and, and creative, higher energy comedy kind of stuff. But on Tuesdays, which it is right now, we read uh, fairy tales by the Fireside. And... Uh, Tonight, we're going to be reading two stories from uh, the last two stories, actually, from Weird Tales of the Northern Sea by Jonas Lai, <clears throat> which is uh, a collection of sort of Norwegian folktales reinterpreted through a uh, writer you may not have heard of, but it was of some repute named Jonas Lai. And uh, the last two stories that we're reading tonight, the first one is the one that the icon of, is about. And if you would like to skip ahead to that right now, and you are not watching this live, then down in the description, there is little timestamps. And you just click those little timestamps, it'll take you right to it. You can skip over any kind of conversation or anything that we're having here. On the other hand, <clears throat> we are looking at two stories tonight, and you can also skip to that second story. Uh, the second story is an odd story, but if you have taken interest in the sort of mythos of the drug, which uh, are sort of the undead at sea, then that would be an interesting one for you. And I left it to the end because it was kind of odd, but also it gave some insight on the draw. So um, we have <clears throat> two stories, in other words, lined up for tonight. Isaac and the Parson of Brano, and, uh, well, the second mystery story. Sorry, just a moment here. Um... Okay, well, I won't uh, I won't bog us down with any sort of um, unnecessary talking. Our first story of the night is called Isaac and the Parson of Brono. It's from Weird Tales from Northern Seas by Jonas Lai. In Halgland was once a fisherman called Isaac. One day, when he was out halibut fishing, he felt something heavy on the lines. He drew up, and lo, there was a sea boot. That was a rummin, said he, and he sat there a long time looking at it. It looked as if it might be the boot of his brother, who'd gone down in the great storm last winter on his way home from fishing. There was still something inside the boat, boot, too, but he durst not look to see what it was, nor did he exactly know what to do with the sea boot, either. He didn't want to take it home and frighten his mother, nor did he quite fancy chucking it back into the sea again. So he made up his mind to go to the parson of Bruno and beg him to bury it in a Christian way. But I can't bury a sea boot, quoth the parson. The fellow scratched his head. Nah, nah, said he. Then he wanted to know how much there ought to be of a human body before it can have the benefit of a Christian burial. Eh, this I cannot exactly tell you, said the parson. A tooth or a finger or hair clippings is not enough to read the burial service over. Anyway... There ought to be so much remaining that one can see that a soul has been in it. But to read Holy Scripture over a toe or two in a sea boot? Oh no, that would never do. But Isaac watched his opportunity. Managed to get the sea boot into the churchyard on the sly all the same. And home he went. It seemed to him that he'd done the best he could. It was better, after all, that something of his brother should lie so near God's house than that he should have heaved the boot back into the Black Sea again. But towards autumn, it so happened that, as he lay out among the skerries on the lookout for seals, and the ebb tide drove masses of tangled seaweed towards him, he fished up a knife belt and an empty sheaf with its his oar blade. He recognized them at once as his brother's, the tarred wire covering of the sheath had been loosened and bleached by the sea, and he remembered quite well how, when his brother had sat and cobbled to, away at the sheath, he had chatted and argued with him about the leather for his belt, which he had taken from an old horse, which they had lately killed. 
They had bought the buckle together over at the storekeepers on the Saturday. The mother had sold bilberries and capercalzies, three pounds of wool. They had got a little tipsy and had had such fun with the old fishwife at the headland who had used a bast mat for a sail. So he took the belt away with him and said nothing about it. It was no good giving pain to no purpose, thought he. But the longer the winter lasted, the more he bothered himself with odd notions about what the parson had said, and he knew not what he should do in the case he came upon anything else, such as another boot, or something that a squid or a fish or a crab or a Greenland shark might have bitten off. He began to be really afraid of rowing out in the sea, there among the scaries. And yet, for all of that, it was as though he were constantly being drawn thither by the hope of finding perhaps so much of the remains as might show the parson where the soul had been, and so move him to give them a Christian burial. He took to walking about all by himself in a brown study, and then too he had such nasty dreams. His door flew open in the middle of the night and let in a cold sea blast, and it seemed to him as if his brother were limping about the room and yelling that he must have his foot again, and the drogs were pulling and twisting about so. For hours and hours he stood over his work without laying a hand to it and blankly staring at the fifth wall. Which apparently is saying that means he's staring at nothing because a house only has four walls. At last he felt as if he were really going out of his wits because of the great responsibility he'd taken upon himself by burying the foot in the churchyard. He didn't want to pitch it into the sea again, but it couldn't lie in the churchyard either. It was borne in upon him so clearly that his brother could not be among the blessed, and he kept going about and thinking of all that might be lying and drifting and floating out among the scaries. So he took it upon himself to dredge there, lay out by the seashore with ropes and dredging gear. But all that he dredged up was sea rack and weeds and starfish and like rubbish. One evening, as he sat out there by the rocks, trying his luck at fishing, and the line with the stone and all the hooks upon it shut down over the boat's side, the last, fair warning, if you're a little squeamish about eyes, just plug your ears for like 10 seconds. <clears throat> the last of the hooks caught in one of his eyes, and right to the bottom went the eye. There was no use dredging for that. And he could see to row home, very well without it. And in the night he lay with a bandage over his eye, wakeful for pain, but he thought and thought till things looked as black as they could be to him. Was there ever anyone in the world in such a hobble as he? All at once, such an odd thing happened. He thought he was looking about him, deep down in the sea, and he saw fishes flitting and snapping among the sea rack and the seaweeds round about the fishling line. They bit at the bait and wriggled and tried to slip off, first a cod, then a ling, then a dogfish. Last of all, a haddock came and stood still there. It chewed the water a little as if it were tasting before swallowing it. And he saw what he couldn't take his eyes off. It looked like the back of a man in leather clothes with one sleeve caught beneath the grapnel of the fembering, which again is a um, sailing boat from Norway in the 19th century. Then a heavy white halibut came up and gulped down the hook and it became pitch dark. You must... Let the big halibut slip off again when you pull up tomorrow, something said. The hook tears my mouth so. Tis of no use excepting in the evening when the tide and the sound is on the ebb. Next day he went off and took a piece of a tombstone from the ch churchyard to dredge the bottom with. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <clears throat> oh, 
Oh, I see it shrunk up a bit. That's very weird. Why did it do that? My apologies. Next day, went off and took a piece of the tombstone from the churchyard to dredge to the bottom with. And in the evening, when the tide had turned, he lay out in the sound again and searched. Immediately, he hauled up the grapnel of a fembering, with hooks, the hooks of which were clinging to a leather fisherman's jacket with the remains of an arm in it. The fishes had got so much as they could out of that leather jacket. Off to the parson, he rode straight away. What? I read the service over a washed-out old leather jacket, cried the parson of Brono. I'll throw the sea boot into the bargain, answered Isaac. Waifs and strays and sea salvage should be advertised in the church porch, thundered the parson. And Isaac looked straight into the parson's face. The sea boot has been heavy enough on my conscience, said he. And I'm sure I don't want to be saddled with a leather jacket as well. I tell you, I do not mean to cast consecrated earth to the winds, said the parson. He was getting wroth. Isaac scratched his head again. Nay, nay, said he. And with that, he had to be content and go home. But Isaac had neither rest nor repose. There lay such a grievous load upon him. In the night time, he saw again the big white halibut. It was going round and round so slowly and sadly in the self-same circle at the bottom of the sea. It was just as if some invisible sort of netting was all around it. And the whole time, it was striving to slip through the meshes. Isaac lay there and gazed and gazed till his blind eye ached again. No sooner was he out dredging the next day, had let down the ropes, than an ugly squid came up and spouted up a black jet right in front of him. But one evening he let the boat drive, as the current chose to take it, outside the skerries, but within the islands, and at last it stopped at a certain spot, as if it were moored fast, and there it grew wondrously still. There was not a bird in the air or a sign of life in the sea. All at once, up came a big bubble right in front of the jib. That's a piece of a boat. As it burst, he heard a deep, heavy <sighs> sigh. But Isaac had his own opinion about what he had seen. And the parson of Brono shall see to the funeral too. Or I'll know the reason why, said he. From henceforth... Or force. <laughs> Fourth, it was rooted abroad that he had second sight, which again is a prophetic sight. Uh, we talked about that last week. And saw many things about him which were hid from other folks. He could tell exactly where the fish were to be found thick together by the sea banks and where they were not. And whenever they asked him about such things, he would say, If I don't know what my brother does. Now one day it chanced that the parson of Brono had to go out along the coast on a pious errand. And Isaac was one of them who had to row him thither. Off they went with a rattling good breeze. The parson got quickly there and was not very long about his business, for next day he had to hold divine service in his own parish church. Parish church, rather. We're not suddenly in France. The Firth seems to me a bit roughish, said he, and tis getting towards evening, but as we have come hither, I th should think we could get back again also. They had not got very far on their homeward journey when the rising gale began to whistle and whine, so that they had to take in four clues, which of course are little notches, on the sail. Um, and away they went with the sea scud and the snowflakes flying about their ears while the waxing rollers rose as big as houses. The parson of Brono had never been out in such weather before. They sailed right into the rollers, and they sailed out again. Soon it became black night. 
The sea shone like a mountain snowfield, and the showers of snow and spray rather waxed than waned. Isaac had just taken in the fifth clue when one of the planks amidships gave way, and the sea foamed in, and the parson of Brono and the crew leaped upon the upper deck and bawled out the boat that was going down. I don't think she'll founder this voyage, said Isaac, and he remained sitting where he was at the rudder. But as the moon peeped forth from behind a hail shower, they saw that a strange foremastman was standing in the scuppers, bailing out water of the boat as fast as it poured in. I didn't know that we had hired that fellow yonder, said the parson of Brono. He seems to me to be bailing with a sea boot. And it also seems to me as if he had neither breeches nor skin upon his legs, and the upper part of him is neither more nor less than an empty fluttering leather jacket. Parson has seen him before, I think, said Isaac. Then the parson of Bruno grew angry. By virtue of my sacred office, said he, I adjure him to depart from amidships. Nah, nah, answered Isaac. And can Parson also answer for the plank that has burst? Then the parson bethought him of the evil case he was in. The man seems to me mortally strong, and we have great need of him, said he. Nor is it any great sin, methinks, to help the servant of gods over the sea. But I should like to know what he wants in return. The billows burst and the blast howled around him. Only some two or three shovels of earth on a rotten sea boot and a moldy skin jacket, said Isaac. If we're able to gad about again here below, I suppose there's nothing against your being able to enter into bliss again. For all that I know, bawled the parson of Brono, and you shall have your shovelfuls of earth into the bargain. And just as he said this, the water within the scaries all at once became quiet and smooth, and the parson's boat drove high and dry upon the sandbank so that the mast cracked. And that is the end. Pardon me, just getting myself a drink of water, and we'll read this second and last story. It's a little longer. Well, there we go. Why the parson wouldn't bury his brother, who knows? Uh, there is an interesting connection. It's entirely unintentional because these were just stories that I left to the end. Um, that the idea of the restless dead not being restless at sea because they could not get a Christian burial comes up again in the next story. Hmm. Uh, GS says good evening and then says I'll bet they found shoes of the loss like we do here the runners that show up i would imagine so i mean uh that if if you don't know i am we're from vancouver here and on our coast for quite a while we had quite a few um shoes with feet in them come rolling up on our coast uh there was a lot of theories as to where they came from but uh um, for the most part it just seems to be that they catch on the current and the shoe floats because they're made of foam and such um, uh, GS also gave it a little eye emoji yeah yeah if you were squeamish about eyes I mean to be fair it was an important part of the tale it wasn't like it was just damage that could be done anything the eye being at the bottom of the water was crucial to the tale but uh, some people are not so good with the eye thing uh, my partner is that way um, GS also says that's very interesting I like the visual of his brother bailing I do as well. I mean, I like the visuals that Jonas creates. Um, okay. Now, this is an odd story. And um, this next one, Finn Blood, is an odd story. So I think it's important to remember that these are stories told from the perspective of a Norwegian man um, from the 19th century. And if you don't know, 
um, it's sort of done tongue in cheek now, but as far as I know, it was fairly serious at the time. There was a lot of like uh, bigotry, I guess would be the right word, or prejudice between Sweden, Norway, and Finland. And in particular, it seems that Jonas Lai was a part of uh, a time that really didn't like Finnish people, I guess, uh, or a part of Norway that didn't like Finnish people at that time. Uh, this story seems to be a way of trying to address that. So from the onset, because it's not a grievance that I think most of my audience would be normally familiar with, you should know that to this day, all the Scandinavian countries t give each other crap. <laughs> and uh, um, that comes from, I mean, it, the word that Freud used for it was the narcissism of small differences. And uh, it also kind of fits with history that the, we tend to hate things that are really almost exactly like us. Uh, there is this tendency to, to see it as like history is mostly people hating things that are quite different than them. But honestly, most wars and everything are fought by people that are very similar to each other, but they have like one or two differences. Somehow that really sets them off. Anyways, this seems to be a bit of a moral tale about that bigotry. Um, it is a strange story. Uh, I would say as a story, I don't know that I fully understand it. Uh, so you'll have to take a shot at it for yourself. I will say that as far as like an experience, as like a tale to go through some interesting ideas and places, it's very cool. I do enjoy it. But I left it to last because I think it is probably one of the more bewildering, at least first halves, of a story in this book. Okay. <clears throat> so this is called Finn Blood. From Weird Tales from Northern Seas by Jonas Lai. In Sjartford, north of Senje, dwelt a lad called Eilert. His neighbors were seafaring Finns, and among their children was a pale little girl, remarkable for her long black hair and her large eyes. They dwelt behind the crag on the other side of the promontory. They fished for a livelihood, as also did Allert's parents. Wherefore, there was no particular goodwill between the families, for the nearest fishing ground was but one a small one, and each would have liked to have, have rowed there alone. I mean, that is the core of most conflict, isn't it? Small pool of resources and minor differences. <clears throat> Nevertheless, though his parents didn't like it at all, and even forbade it, Eilert used to sneak regularly down to the Finns. There they had always they had always strange tales to tell, and he heard wondrous things about recesses of the mountains where the original home of the Finns was, and where in the olden time dwelt the Finn kings, who were masters among the magicians. There too he heard tell of all that was beneath the sea. Where the mermen and the drogs hold sway, the latter are gloomy, evil powers, and many a time his blood stood still in his veins as he sat up and listened. They told him that the drog usually showed himself on the strand, in the moonlight, on those spots which were covered with sea rack, that he had a bunch of seaweed instead of a head, but shaped so peculiar. Clearly, that whoever came across him absolutely couldn't help gazing into his pale, horrible face. They themselves had seen him many a time, and once they had driven him thwart by thwart out of the boat where he sat one morning and turned the oars upside down. When I alert, hastened homewards in the darkness, round the headland, along the strand, over heaps of seaweed, he dare scarcely look around him, and many times the sweat absolutely streamed from his forehead. In proportion, as hostility increased among the old people, they had a good deal of fault to find with one another, and Eilert had no 
end of evil things spoken about the Finns at home. Now it was this and now it was that. And they didn't even row like honest folk, for after the Finnish fashion, they took high and swift strokes as if they were womankind. And they all talked together and made noise while they rowed instead of being silent in the boat. But what most impressed Eilert most of all was the fact that in the Finn woman's family, they practiced sorcery and idolatry. Or, so folks said. He also heard tell of something beyond all question. That was the shame of having Finn blood in one's veins. Which was also the reason why the Finns were not as good as the other honest folk. So that the magistrates gave them their own distinct burial ground in the churchyard and their own separate Finn pens in the church. Eilert had seen this with his own eyes in the church at Berg. <clears throat> All this made him very angry, for he, he could not help liking the Finn folks down yonder, especially the little Zilla. They too were always together. She knew such a lot about the merman. Henceforth, his conscience was always plagued, had always plagued him when he played with her. And whenever she stared at him with her large black eyes, while she told him tales, he used to begin to feel a little bit afraid, for at such times he reflected that she and her people belonged to the damned. And that was why they knew so much about such things. But on the other hand, the thought of it made him so bitterly angry, especially on her account. She too was frequently taken aback by his odd behavior towards her, which she couldn't understand at all. And then, as was her wont, she would begin laughing at and teasing him by making him run after her while she went and hid herself. One day, he found her sitting on a boulder by the seashore. She had in her lap an eider duck, which had been shot and could only have died quite recently, for it was still warm, and she wept bitterly over it. It was, she sobbed, the same bird which made its nest every year beneath the shelter of their outhouse. She knew it quite well, and showed him a red-colored feather in its white breast. It had been struck dead by a single shot, and only a single red drop had come out of it. It had tried to reach its nest, but had died on its way on the strand. She wept as if her heart would break and dried her face with her hair in impetuous Finnish fashion. Eilert laughed at her as boys will, but he overdid it and was very pale the whole time. He dared not tell her that that very day he'd taken a random shot with his father's gun from behind the headland at a bird a long way off which was swimming ashore. One autumn, Eilert's father was downright desperate. Day after day on the fishing ground, his lines caught next to nothing. Well, he was forced to look on and see the fin pull up one rich catch after another. He was sure, too, that he had noticed malicious gestures over in the Finn's boat. In other words, magical stuff. <clears throat> After his whole house nourished a double bitterness against them, and when they talked it over in the evening, it was agreed, as a thing beyond all question, that Finnish sorcery had something to do with it. Against this, there was only one remedy, and that was to rub corpse mold on the lines, which is just dirt that someone's been buried with. But one must beware of doing so, lest one should thereby offend the dead and expose oneself to their vengeance, while the sea folk would gain power over one at the same time. Eilert bothered his head a good deal over all of this. It, it almost seemed to him as if he had had a share in the deed because he was on such a good footing with the Finn folk. On the following Sunday, both he and the Finn folks were at the Berg church, and he secretly abstracted a handful of mold from one of the Finn graves and put it in his pocket. The same evening when they came home, he strewed the mold over his father's lines unobserved. And oddly enough, the very next day, his father cast his lines, as many fish were caught as in the good old times. But after this, Eilert's anxiety became indescribable. He was especially cautious while they were working 
of an evening round the fireside, and it was dark in the distant corners of the room. He sat there with a piece of steel in his pocket to beg forgiveness of the dead, is the only helpful means against the consequences of such deeds as his. Otherwise, one will be dragged off at night by an invisible hand to the churchyard, though one were lashed fast to the bed as a by a ship's hawser. While Eilert, on the following preaching Sunday, went to church, he took good care to go to the grave and beg forgiveness of the dead. As Eilert grew older, he got to understand that the Finn folks must, after all, be pretty much the same sort of folks as his own folks at home. But on the other hand, another thought was now uppermost in his mind. The thought, namely, that the Finns must be of an inferior stock, with a taint of disgrace about them. Nevertheless, he could not very well do without Zilla's society, and they were very much together as before, especially at the time of their confirmation. But when Eilert became a man and mixed more with the people of the parish, he began to fancy that this old companionship lowered him somewhat in the eyes of his neighbors. There was nobody who did not believe as a matter of course that there was something shameful about Finn blood, and he therefore tried to avoid her company. The girl understood it all well enough, for latterly she took care to keep out of his way. Nevertheless, one day she came, as had been her wont from childhood, down to their house and begged for leave to go in their boat when they rowed to church the next day. There were a lot of strangers present from the village, and so I alert lest folks think that he and she were engaged, answered mockingly so that everyone could hear him. That church cleansing was perhaps a very good thing for Finnish sorcery, but she must find someone else to ferry her across. Well, after that, she never spoke to him at all, but I alert was anything but happy in the consequence. Now it happened one winter that Eilert was out all alone fishing for Greenland shark. A shark suddenly bit. The boat was small and the fish was very big. But Eilert would not give in and the end of the business was that his boat capsized. All night long he lay on top of it in the midst of a, and a cruel sea. And now he sat there almost fainting for drowsiness and dimly conscious that the end was not far off. And the sooner it came, the better. And he suddenly saw a man in seaman's clothes sitting astride on the other end of the boat's bottom and glaring savagely at him with a pair of dull reddish eyes. He was so heavy that the boat's bottom began to slowly sink and sink and sink down at end where he sat. Then he suddenly vanished, but now it seemed to Eilert as if the sea fog lifted a bit and the sea had all at once grown quite calm. At least there was now only a gentle swell. And right in front of him lay a little low gray island towards which the boat was slowly drifting. The scary was wet, as if the sea had only recently been flowing over it, and on it he saw a pale girl with such lovely eyes. She wore a green kirtle, and round her body a broad silver girdle with figures upon it, such as the Finns use. Her bodice was of tar-brown skin, and beneath her stay laces, which seemed to be of green sea grass, was a foam-white Chami, with the feathery breast of a seabird. When the boat came drifting onto the island, she came down to him and said, as if he she knew him quite well, So you are come at last, Eilert. I've been waiting for you so long. It seemed Eilert as if an ice, icy cold shudder ran through his body when he took the hand which helped him ashore, but it was only for a moment. And he forgot it instantly. Give me a moment. Just getting a drink of water. In the midst of the island, there was an opening with an 
a brazen flight of steps leading down to a splendid cabin. Whilst he stood there thinking things over a bit, he saw two heavy dogfish swimming close by. They were at least 12 to 14 owls long. As they descended, the dogfish sank down too, each on one side of the brazen steps. Oddly enough, it looked as if the island was transparent. When the girl perceived that he was frightened, she told him that there were only two of her body, father's bodyguard. And shortly afterward, they disappeared. She then said that she wanted to take him to her father, who was waiting for them. She added that if he didn't find the old gentleman precisely as handsome as he might expect, he had, nevertheless, no need to be frightened, nor was he to be astonished too much at what he saw. He now perceived that he was underwater, but for all of that, there was no sign of moisture. He was on a white, sandy bottom, covered with chalk white, red, blue, silvery bright shells. He saw meadows of seagrass, mountains thick with woods of bushy seaweed and sea rack, and fishes darted about on every side just as the birds swarmed through the rocks and the sea fell hot. That sea fell hot. As they were, as they too were thus walking along together, she explained many things to him. High up, he saw something which looked like a black cloud with a white lining. Beneath it moved backwards and forwards a shape resembling one of the dogfish. What you see is a vessel, said she. There's nasty weather up there now. And beneath the boat goes he who was sitting along with you on the bottom of the boat just now. If it is wrecked, it will belong to us. And then you will not be able to speak to father today. As she said this, there was a wild, rapturous gleam in her eyes, but it was gone again immediately. And in point of fact, it was no easy matter to make out the meaning of her eyes. As a rule, they were unfathomably dark with the luster of a night billow through which the sea fire sparkles. But occasionally when she laughed, they took a bright sea green glitter. And when the sun, as when the sun shines deep down into the sea. Now and again they passed by a boat or a vessel half buried in the sand, out and in of the cabin doors and windows of which fishes swam to and fro. Close by the wrecks wandered human shapes which seemed to consist of nothing more but blue smoke. His conductress explained to him that these were the spirits of drowned men who had not had a Christian burial. One must beware of them, for dead ones of this sort are malignant. They always know when one of their own race is about to be wrecked. And at such times they howl with the death warning of the drog through the wintry nights. Then they went further on their way, right across a deep dark valley. In the rocky walls above them they saw a four-cornered white doors, from which a sort of glimmer, as from the northern light, shot downwards through the darkness. This valley stretched in a northeastwardly direction, right towards Finnmark, she said, and inside the white doors, doors dwelt the old Finn kings who had perished on the sea. Then she went and opened the nearest of these doors. Here, down in the salt ocean, was the last of the kings, who had capsized in the very breeze that he himself had conjured forth, but could not afterwards quell. There on a block of stone sat a wrinkled yellow fin with running eyes and a polished dark red crown. His large head rocked backwards and forwards on his withered neck, as if it were in the swirl of an ocean current. Beside him on the same block sat a still more shriveled and yellow little woman, who also had a crown on it, and her garments were covered with all sorts of colored stones. She was stirring up a brew with a stick. If she only had fire beneath it, the girl told Eilert, she and her husband would very soon have dominion again over the salt sea. For the thing she was stirring about was magic stuff. In the middle of a plain, 
which opened right before them. At a turn of the road stood a few houses together like a little town. And a little further on, Eilert saw a church turned upside down, looking with its long pointed tower as if it were mirrored in the water. The little girl explained to him that her father dwelt in these houses, and the church was one of the seven that stood in his realm, which extended all over Helgeland and the Finnmark. No service was held in them yet, but it would be held when the drowned bishop, who sat outside in a brown study, could only hit upon the name of the Lord that was to be served, and then all the drogs could, would go to church. The bishop, she said, had been sitting and pondering the matter over these eight hundred years. So he would no do doubt very soon get to the bottom of it. A hundred years ago, the bishop had advised them to send up one of the drogs to Rodo Church to find out all about it. But every time the word he wanted was mentioned, he couldn't catch the sound of it. In the mountain, Kunin King Olaf had hung a church bell of pure gold and it is guarded by the first priest who ever came to Nordland who stands there in a white chasuble. On the day the priest rings the bell, Kunin will become a big stone church to which all Nordland, both above and below the sea, will resort. But time flies, and therefore all who come down here below are asked by the bishop if they can tell him that name. At this, Eilert felt very queer indeed, and he felt queer still when he began reflecting and found to his horror that he'd also forgotten the name. While he stood there and thought, the girl looked at him so anxiously, it was almost as if she wanted to help him to find it and couldn't. With that, she all at once grew deadly pale. The drog's house to which they now came was built of boats' keels and large pieces of wreckage in the interstices of which grew all sorts of green grasses and slimy green stuff. Three monstrously heavy green posts covered with shellfish formed the entrance, and the door consisted of planks which had sunk to the bottom and were full of clincher nails. In the middle of it, like a knocker, was a heavy rusty iron mooring ring with the worn away stump of a ship's hawser hanging to it. When they came up to it, a large black arm stretched out and opened the door. They were now in a vaulted chamber with fine shell sand on the floor. In the corners lay all sorts of ropes and yarn and boating gear, and among them casks and barrels of various ships' inventories. On a heap of yarn covered by an old red patch sail, Eilert saw the drog, a broad-shouldered, strongly built fellow with a glazed hat shoved back on top of his head with dark red tangled hair and a beard and small tearful dogfish eyes and a broad mouth round which there lay for the moment a good-natured seaman's grin the shape of his head reminded one somewhat of the big sort of seal which is called clacacal his skin about the neck looked dark and shaggy and the tops of his fingers grew together he sat there with turned down sea boots on, and his thick grey woolen stockings reached right up to his thigh. He wore besides plain clothes with bright glass buttons on his waistcoat. His spacious skin jacket was open, and round his neck he had a cheap red woolen scarf. When Eilert came up, he made as if he would rise, and said good naturedly. <clears throat> Good day, Alan. You've certainly had a hard time of it today. Now you can sit down if you like. Take a little grub. You want it, I'm sure. And with that, he squirted out a jet of tobacco juice like the spouting of a whale. With one foot, which for that purpose, special purpose, all at once grew extraordinarily long, fished out of a corner in true Nordland style, the skull of a whale to serve as a chair for Eilert, and shoved forward with his hands on a long ship's drawer full of first-rate fare. 
There was boiled groats with syrup, cured fishes, oat cakes with butter, a large stack of flat cakes, and a multitude of the best hotel dishes besides. The merman bade him fall to eat and fall to and eat his fill and ordered his daughter to bring out the last keg of Throngheim Aquavita, which is just alcohol. Um, of that sort, that last is always the best, he said he. When he came with it, Eilert thought he knew it again. It was his father's and he himself only a couple of days before and bought the brandy from the wholesale dealer in Kveitford. But he said, didn't say anything about that now. The quid of tobacco, too, which the drog turned somewhat impatiently in his mouth before he drank, also seemed to him wonderfully like the lead on, of, on his own line. At first, it seemed to him as if he didn't quite know how to manage with the keg. His mouth was so sore, but afterwards, things went along smoothly enough. So they sat for some time pretty silently and drank glass after glass, till Eilert began to think that this had gone on quite enough. So when it came to his turn again, he said, no, he would rather not. Whereupon the merman put the keg to his own mouth <clears throat> and drained it to the very dregs. <laughs> then he stretched his long arm up to the shelf and took down another. He was now in better humor and began to talk of all sorts of things, but every time he laughed, Eilert felt queer, for the drog's mouth gaped ominously wide, and he showed a greenish pointed row of teeth with long intervals between each tooth, so that they resembled a row of boat stakes. The merman dragged keg after keg after keg after keg, and with every keg he grew more communicative. With an air as if he were thinking in his own mind of something very funny, he looked at Eilert for a while, blinked his eyes, and Eilert didn't like his expression at all, for it seemed to him to say, Now, my lad, whom I've fished up so nicely, look out for a change. But instead of that, he said, you had a rough time of it last night, Eilert, my boy, but it wouldn't have gone so hard if you hadn't streaked the lines with corpse mold and refused to take my daughter to church. Here he suddenly broke off, as if he'd said too much, and to prevent himself from completing that sentence, he put the brandy keg to his mouth once more, but this same instant Eilert caught his glance. It was so full of deadly hatred that it sent a shiver right down his back. When after a long, long draft, he again took the keg from his mouth. The merman, merman was again in good humor and he told tale after tale and stretched himself out more and more heavily out on the sail and laughed and grinned complacently at his own narrations, the humor of which was always a, a wreck or a drowning. From time to time, Eilert felt the breath of his laughter and it was like a cold blast. If folks would only give up their boats, he said. He had no great, very great desire for the cruise. It was driftwood and ship timber he was after, and he really couldn't get on without them. When his stock ran out, boat or ship he must have, and surely nobody could blame him for it either. With that, he put the keg down empty and became somewhat more gloomy again and began to talk about bad times they were for him and her. It was not as it used to be, he said. He stared blankly before him for a time, as if buried in deep thought. Then he stretched himself out backwards at full length, with feet extending right across the floor, and gasped so dreadfully that his upper and lower jaws resembled two boats' keels facing each other. Then he dozed right off, with his neck turned towards the sail. Then the girl again stood by Eilert's side and bade him follow her. They now went the same way back and again ascended up to the scary. Then she confided to him that the reason why her father had been so bitter against him was because he had mocked her with the taunt about church cleansing when she had wanted to go to church. The name the folks down below wanted to know might, the merman thought, 
be treasured up in Eilert's memory, but during their conversation on the way down to her father, she had perceived that he had also forgotten it. And now he must look to his life. It would be a good deal later on the day before the old fellow would begin inquiring about him. Till then, he, Eilert, must sleep so as to have sufficient strength for his flight. She would watch over him. The girl flung her long, dark hair about him like a curtain, and it seemed to him that he knew those eyes so well. He felt as if his cheek were resting against the breast of a white seabird. It was so warm and sleep-giving, and a single reddish feather in the middle of it recalled a dark memory. Gradually he sank off into a doze, and he heard her singing a lullaby which reminded him of the swell of the billows when it ripples up and down along the beach on a fine sunny day. It was all about how they had once been playmates together, and how later on he would have nothing to say to her. Of all she sang, however, he could only recollect the, recollect, sorry, the last words, which were these. Oh, thousands of times have we played on the shores and caught little fishes. Dost mind it no more? We raced with the surf as it rolled at our feet, and lurking old mermen we always did cheat. Yes, thou shalt thou think of at my lullaby. Whilst thou billows do rock and the breezes do sigh. Who sits now and weeps o'er thy cheeks? It is she who gave her thee thy soul, gave thee her soul, and whose soul lived in thee. But once as an eider duck homeward I came, Thou didst lie neath a rock, and with thy rifle didst aim, And in my breast thou didst strike me, the blood thou dost see, Is the mark that I bear, O oh, beloved one of thee. Then it seemed to Eilert as if she sat and wept over him, And that from time to time a drop like a splash of seawater fell upon his cheek. He felt now that he loved her so dearly. The next moment he again became uneasy. He fancied the right up to the scary came a wheel. He fancied that right up to the scary came a wail, which said that he, Eilert, must now make haste. And when he stood on its back, he stuck the shaft of his oar down his nostril to prevent it from shooting beneath the sea again. He perceived that in this way, the whale could be steered accordingly as he turned the oar to the right or left. And now they coasted the whole land of Finnmark at such a rate that the huge mountain island shot by them like little rocks. Behind him he saw the drog in his half-boat, and he was going so swiftly that the foam stood mid-mast high. Shortly afterwards he was again lying on the scary, and the lass smiled so blithely. She bent over him and said, It is I, Alert. With that he awoke and saw that the sunbeams were running over the wet scary, and the mermaid was still sitting by his side. But presently the whole thing changed before his eyes. It was the sun shining through the window panes on a bed in the Finn's hut, and by his side sat the Finn girl supporting his back, for they thought he was about to die. He'd lain there delirious for six weeks, ever since the Finn had rescued him after capsizing, and this was his first moment of consciousness. After that, it seemed to him that he'd never heard anything so absurd and presumptuous as the twaddle that would fix a stigma of shame or contempt on Finn blood, and that the same spring he and Finn girl Zilla were betrothed, and in the autumn, they were married. They were Finns in the bridal procession, and perhaps many said a little more about that than they need have done, but everyone at the wedding agreed that the fiddler, who was also a Finn, was the best fiddler in the whole parish and the bride, the prettiest girl. And that is the end of Weird Tales from Northern Sea, Jonas Lye's book on stories. I, my perception is, Jonas Lye was an author in and of himself, and my perception is these were books. These were stories he heard growing up in his, his province of Norway, or his specific province within Norway, I should say. Um... <clears throat> that are sort of interpreted by him into, you know, with literary flourish, for sure. Um, 
I really enjoyed this book. It's one of my favorite books that we have found together. Uh, next week, we'll start into something different. We'll see what it is, but I have enjoyed these greatly. Please remember to uh, like uh, if you have not liked the video um, and subscribe. I, I appreciate it. it. It's a little like boost of confidence every time I see it. Um, <clears throat> and beyond that, uh, come by on Thursday at 630. If you want to do some actual writing yourself with us in chat, we do sort of a little group project thing. <laughs> I guess, um, where we write together. Sometimes it's very silly. Sometimes it's chat kind of screwing you up. But uh, we're sort of trying out this uh, this kind of Bob Ross thing where everybody uh, tries to do a little bit of writing on their own and we sort of talk some principles together. And, and this week we'll be doing uh, how to sort of manifest character traits in writing. Um, GS uh, says... Um, what a visual of the sea bottom. Yeah, actually, that's sort of what I mean. Like the story itself knocks around a bit in the first half and it's not always clear what it's doing. But once you get to that sea bottom, it's such a beautiful idea. It reminds me a lot of um, the uh, the Irish sea bottom and lake bottom uh, mythos that we looked at back in January. Um <clears throat> So it's apparently a very common thing. It's also a thing I have not read it on the channel because um, I don't think I could do justice to those stories, but uh, it's also a thing in Japanese folktales. Um, GS also says how poignant the poison of prejudice. Yeah, absolutely. A lot to think about in every story. Love this book, Rory. I did too. I've looked everywhere to find like an older copy of it and nobody's ever heard of it which is a shame. There are like reprints, but they're kind of, eh, they're okay. I think it's a book that deserves a, you know, a little bit of a, a stink of age on it. Um, and uh, Holly's house said, that's huge. I'm only about seven L's long. Because <laughs> we said L's, an old form of measurement. Oh yes, GS says happy National Indigenous Day. And indeed, happy National Indigenous Day. Um, to the many people I know who are indigenous. Um, there we are. There we go. Uh, which reminds me, um, I have my standing recommendation that you guys go and read the introduction to um, the Truth and Reconciliation Report. Technically a Canadian thing, but I think it's helpful for anybody. The first about 200 pages of the like prehistory to 1930s, I think, is the section. Like the books themselves are huge. They're free. They're online, but they're huge. They're PDFs. Um, <clears throat> uh, the first 200 pages will really open your eyes to things that you probably never knew. Um, not all horrible things, by the way. Just sort of a view of history that you have not been offered. Um. But beyond that, thank you so much for uh, joining me for all of the Jonas live streams, those who have. And we'll be back next week with something equally compelling, I hope. <laughs> I've been Rory. I'll keep the fire warm for you. Get a good sleep. Mm -hmm.